I'm Andrew Gelman, um, professor in statistics and political science here, and I was asked to moderate measuring scholarly impact, the influence of alt metrics on a changing conversation, the second of four events in the Research Without Borders speaker series for the 2012-2013 academic year. Uh, this event is sponsored by Columbia's Scholarly Communication Program. Um, I just want to say that for me, I mean, this, this is um, an important topic for me and I think for just about everyone who does scholarly research because the only reason we're doing it is to have some influence on the, on the conversation. Uh, so, and I think we scholars tend to be very questioning about everything except themselves. So it's, it's, we, we accept whatever, whatever metrics are out there and so I think it is very important for people to be creative and, and to be thinking in a scholarly way about how we think about scholarly impact. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers now and each will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll have time for a discussion and questions so please hold your questions for afterwards but please do me a favor and make a note of what your question is because otherwise you'll forget what it was. Um, when, you, um, when you do ask questions, we're videotaping, so um, use the microphone in the middle of the room so we can hear the question on the video. Um, now I'd like to introduce the panelists. Uh, Jason Prem is a PhD student um, and Royster Fellow studying information science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Since coining the term altmetrics, he's retired because once you've coined a term, I think that's really enough. Uh, you can rest on your laurels. Actually, he's remained active in the field, organizing annual workshops on the topics, uh, giving invited talks, and publishing peer-reviewed research. Um, he is also the co-founder of Impact Story, an open source web app that helps scholars track and report the broader impacts of their research. And I personally think I need a web app that doesn't allow me to Google myself. I think that would be my main, the worst was when I did that and then, and then I found like all these people who were attacking me and they were like nobodies. So I didn't even need to respond, I just got upset. Sometimes he writes on a blog at uh, jasonpream.org and he even tweets. Um, Christy Holmes is a bioinformaticist at Becker Medical Library at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine where she works to help develop and support cross-disciplinary initiatives. Um, her professional interests include development and implementation of strategies for biomedical training and research, collaboration and research networking, open science, and understanding the impact of research efforts. She's director of outreach for Vivo and a member of the Washington University Institute of Clinical and Translational Sciences tracking and evaluation team. And finally, um, Caitlin Aptowitz Tresand is head of science metrics at Digital Science, a technology startup company spun out of Nature Publishing Group, publisher of Nature. Her international team of developers leverages the latest techniques in machine learning to build software that analyzes scientific publications to support information products for science managers and decision makers. She has an undergraduate degree in philosophy and history of mathematics and science and a PhD in neurobiology from the University of Chicago where she trained as an electrophysiologist. So I wanted to talk really quickly about uh, what I think of as sort of the second revolution in scholarly communication. So I'm going to talk a little bit about history, about how we got here. Then I'm going to try and move on um, to talk about uh, new ways of communicating, uh, new ways of measuring, and finally how that could affect maybe what I think of, like I said, as a second revolution. So in the beginning, uh, scholarly communication was all based on letters, right? I mean, in fact, you know, there's this idea of the republic of letters, um, you know, people uh, at that time called men of science would sort of exchange letters from one to another and that was sort of what scholarly communication was built on. You used the available technology but of course it had a lot of problems, right? Slow, costly, a lot of duplication. So uh, in 1665 Oldenburg published the first journal and he said look why don't we just gather all these letters together, let's put them all in one place and then I'll just publish them all together. It's a lot, a lot of duplication, it's really handy. Um, and the nice thing about this was again it, it sort of applied the best available technology at the time, the printing press, to solving the problem of uh, distrib distributing scientific information. This, this revolution in scientific communication promoted a homogeneity of outputs, by which I mean the same sorts of articles, right? Like you want to try and if you're running everything through a printing press, 
and you know you want to bind it in a journal and distribute it all over the place. You want kind of every product to be about the same, right? Sort of this tailorization or forward model, right? Of like industrial outputs, particularly after World War II. But the second revolution, I suggest, will promote a diversity of outputs, right? It's not hard to publish things anymore. It's not expensive to publish any, anything anymore, and so we don't have to kind of press everything into a cookie cutter sort of. Um, uh, mold, right, because we can sort of publish whatever we want. We can publish conversations, we can publish stories, we can publish analyses, we can publish data, we can publish all that stuff, right? So for example, conversation, stuff we're talking about right now, right, is being published on the internet, um, for better or worse. Uh, stories, right, we, we write a paper, that's sort of a story about an experiment, right? We did an experiment, we tell you the story about it. Um, the analysis we can publish, so I, I do studies now where all of my analysis is in R code, right, so I got my statistical analysis. I published that on GitHub. If someone wants to fork my R code and run my analysis, run all my statistics on it, they can. It's easy as pie, right? And then finally, the data. The data is actually at the, you know, the bottom because it's the foundation of the whole thing. Without the data, there's kind of no point, right? So we can even publish the data sets. We can publish all of these different sorts of items. We can also start to look at these different, um, different means of communication that the web allows us to do. So, for instance, we got web ref bleh, reference managers, blogs, social bookmarking, social networks. There's all these different approaches researchers can take to communicating. So a good example of that is Mendeley. Now, Mendeley isn't sort of thought of as a communication tool. Uh, it's a reference manager. It's quite similar to EndNote or RefWorks or anything like that. It's got 1.6 you know, million users, 160 million papers, very, very large database of papers. But in some ways, it's a communication tool because there's this sort of social aspect to it. I can show you my Mendeley library, you can show me yours, and um, there's an open API so that people can query to find out if things are in our Mendeley libraries. Another example that I'm, I'm really excited about because I spend a lot of time on this is Twitter. So in one month, uh, you know, 60,000-ish citations from Twitter to scholarly articles, that's a fair amount of activity in this particular area, right? Um, we did a study on this because we were curious, you know, do scholars see Twitter as a scholarly space at all? Or is it really just a space where they talk about their lunches, right? And um, what we got back was really encouraging, at least for someone who's interested in, in new forms of scholarly communication. Our participants saying things like, it's like having a jury pre-select what will interest you. Um, when I see things on Twitter, sometimes it'll change what I think or change what I'm interested in. To me, that sounds very similar to the kind of conversations that scientists and scholars have always had. These sort of uh, underground conversations, these sort of what people, you know, to solve price refer to as the invisible college. But the cool thing is we kind of maybe have access to it now. So another, another study we did on Twitter, this is showing um, growth in scholarly use of Twitter. Um, I can get more into the details of the study and the question if you'd like, but it's enough to see uh, basically all of these little dots are individual tweets, and you can see sort of the slope of this graph climbing as the number of Twitter, uh, tweeting scholars grows. Um, all the code, by the way, speaking of ARCA, right, so you could generate this. Like my data's online, my code's online, you want to go download, just click a button and you get this graph, which I think is really cool. All right, so we're, so we're talking about metrics, right? I'm talking about new ways of communicating, but we want to talk about metrics. How can we measure those? Well, again, uh, my background's in history, so I like to kind of start with a bit of history. Um, the idea of measuring communication is a relatively new one. Um, it existed before Garfield, but Garfield was certainly the one who popularized it. Um, he created the Science Citation Index, and what's really cool, what's really awesome and really transformative and, and just actually quite beautiful about this idea of bibliometrics, of, of citation mining, which is not exactly the same as bibliometrics, but I'll use them interchangeably for the purposes of this talk, is that it replaces expert judgments with crowdsourced judgments. The problem that Garfield was trying to solve is in the post-war years, the amount of research was booming, it was exploding. And the ways that that research had been filtered up until then was basically experts. Expert people would read the, the papers, they would write out their own little abstract, they'd have an abstract in service, and then you would read the abstracts. But Garfield realized, and everyone's starting to realize, that this was not scaling very well. The amount of research was, you know, exploding, and the people smart enough and educated enough to be able to, uh, you know, with the, exp the right expertise to create these abstracts were in very short supply. And it didn't scale at the same speed as the literature. So he said, why don't, instead of we ask people what's important, why don't we listen to what they say is important already? I think that's a really important idea, a really, um, like I said, kind of a really transformative idea. He started mining the citation graph. He said, well, you know, who's a better expert about the scientific literature than a guy who just wrote a literature review about that field, right? I mean, that's sort of a, a you know, you, won't, you wouldn't have to go ask. You could just look. You could say, what sorts of things did this person cite? And from that information, you could say, this is, this is the important stuff in this field. So he started, so Garfield started this idea of mining the literature, of mining the kind of interactions people were already having, and using that to try and um, get a better picture of the flow of ideas, right? 
ultimately, citation mining is about tracing the flow of ideas. An idea is an ephemeral thing, right? It doesn't, ha it doesn't have physical sort of, uh, you know, reality, but we can, we can measure its tracks, and that's a really cool idea. The bad thing about this is that it's only part of the picture. So you only really track one person's uh, influence, or sorry, influence on one sort of person. You're only tracking uh, influence on academics because they're the only people who cite. You only really track the influence of one kind of resource, scholarly articles, because by and large, scholarly articles are the only things that are cited. And then finally, you only track one kind of use, using it to support a scholarly article. You're ignoring a lot of other kinds of uses, like maybe using you know, clinical practice, patents, public discourse, all kinds of things. Yeah? You're, you're also overcounting sometimes because you're counting journals that cite themselves just to get higher. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And, and not, even, not only that, but there's a whole school of, of criticism of bibliometrics that focuses on uh, the, uh, the fact that it's called the social constructivist school. And in fact, focuses on the fact that these, are, these formal indications of impact, they're very intentional. And because of that, they can also be used as a rhetorical strategy. So people often cite uh, to add credence to their own views, right? Like if I cite Einstein right after what I say, like maybe, you know, it gives it a little bit of a, a polish on it, right? Or a lot of times even worse, if I know that my advisor wrote something in a very slightly related field, I kind of have to cite him, right? It's like sort of an expected thing. So there's this whole network of, of formal relationships there. Um, this is a, a known problem, and since the very early days of bibliometrics, this was a known problem. So Garfield says that Garfield himself said, there's a lot of useful journals that aren't being reflected in the citation record. Bernal, great historian of science, really interesting, said science communication, scientific communication is really about the personal stuff, the underground stuff, the things, uh, what I you know, sometimes call the shadow system of scholarly communication. And then finally, you know, Kuhn, who needs no introduction, says if we want to track emerging research fronts, we're not, it's not going to be enough to just look at the formal literature, because that's the stuff that rises to the top years after the actual um, intellectual, uh, the intellectual contributions have been made. So what's concerning to me about the citation, uh, you know, the approach of cita citation mining, for all its awesomeness, and I think it's very awesome, it's very beautiful, is we can start to confuse the kind of use we can track with use. And we can start to confuse citation impact with impact. And I think that could be a really bad thing. So my suggestion is that we start looking a little bit more broadly. So bibliometrics mines impact on the first scholarly web, the web of citations, right, the web that predates the internet. Altmetrics mines impact on the next web of scholarly communication, which is built largely on the World Wide Web. So I want to show you kind of a little bit of framework here. What, what kinds of things am I talking about, about tracking, and why would we want to track them? So this framework separates things into, uh, first of all, two different audiences. So we could have impact on both scholarly audiences, which citations do an okay job of tracking right now, but also on the public. And then we could also think of impact in terms of levels of engagement. So, um, Sorry, this thing that says scholarly at the bottom should say uh, viewed. My apologies. Uh, so at the bottom, we might say viewed, right? That's not a very high level of engagement. It's not very difficult to just click on something, look at it, and be like, okay, Jason Preem, he's talking about something stupid again. I'll go somewhere else, right? Like, that's pretty easy, right? You viewed it. There's no, there's no engagement there, right? But it's still useful, right? It's still an interesting idea, right? And then you, we could kind of move up to save, right? Like, I think it was good enough to save it in my library. And then we can move up to disgust. Not only did I save it, I wanted to talk to somebody about it. And then from there, we can move up to cite it, right? Not only do I want to talk about it, but I actually think it kind of underlies the kind of work that I'm doing. And then finally, all the way, way to recommend it, right? Recommend is a big deal because you're putting your reputation on the line. If you say, hey, guys, y'all should read this thing, right? That's an important, that's, I, that means I, I probably really care about it. Um, all of these uses are, are important. I, 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 you know, I kind of have them stacked like this. I wouldn't necessarily want to say, wouldn't necessarily say one is better than the other, but they certainly do represent different kinds of engagement. So if you look in these cells, you can see that Nowadays, we actually have stuff to put in all of these cells that we can measure, which is really cool to me, right? Discussions have always been a thing, right? I mean, we're, we're going to finish this talk, and hopefully you guys are going to discuss it, you're going to think about it, but they just evaporate into air, right? They go away, those discussions. But increasingly, those discussions don't evaporate into air, and when they don't, when they leave traces, we can find really cool things about them. Um, so, for instance, I'm not going to go through every cell of this table, but a couple of examples, right? Like, so, like, I like citation, right? We have citations for scholars. That's traditional. It's been happening a while. But what about citations from the public? If something's cited in Wikipedia, surely that's an impact that matters, right? A lot of people go to, a huge number of people go to Wikipedia as their first source for information. If something is behind a Wikipedia article, it's a thing that maybe is making a big difference in the world. I think that's really cool. Um, you know, again, like, discussion could happen on blogs, Twitter. Um, 
I have Twitter in, in public because if you just sort of randomly sample Twitter discussions, it's going to be mostly the public. If you're a little bit more focused, of course, and you look at particular scholars, then that could be a, a source of scholarly discussion as well. So I want to um, show you something that we built to do this. How much time do I have? Ten more minutes? Great, thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to show you this thing that we built. So this was built with a generous grant from the Sloan Foundation. And um, it's uh, me and Heather Povovar, who's active in the data citation community. And we said, you know, this is really cool. What if we built something for scholars to help gather, you know, this information? So the result is this thing called Impact Story. And um, it's an open source project, as I think was mentioned earlier. It's a nonprofit project. Um, and our goal for this is to, uh, to build something that scholarly community can use to tell deeper, broader, and more nuanced stories of impact, moving beyond just the impact factor moving beyond just articles and actually telling kind of the whole story. So um, let me actually, so this is a live demo, which means it will almost certainly break. But if it doesn't, it'd be awesome. So this is the, the site. These are some of the places that <clears throat> on the bottom, those are some of the places that we get information from. So Scopus and you know Twitter are pretty well recognized. Dryad is a data repository. If there's a knowledge librarian here, you all know what Crossref is. So we kind of have a wide array of different um, places that we search for evidence of impact. So if you wanted to make one of these, you would go, and it works now, you could do this now. Uh, you would go to here and you would input your, um, your information. So if you had a list of DOIs or data set IDs or PubMed IDs, you could paste them in there. If you had an ORCID, you could paste it there. Uh, anyone know what ORCID is? Awesome. Do you mind sharing what ORCID is? Do you mind sharing what work it is? Uh, so it is um, researchers can register there and put all their talks, uh, sorry, all their papers online and actually paste information. It's like a non-profit version of the researcher ID. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. And so, um, so you get this, you know, it's kind of like, a, I think it was sort of like a DOI for research, right? It's like sort of a unique thing and it aggregates all your stuff. So if you paste your ORCID in there, it'll get all your papers. You could uh, export everything from Google Scholar, which a lot of times if you have a profile does a pretty good job of gathering your papers all together. Uh, or like I said, you could paste them in there. So you make this thing um, and you hit go. And I'm not going to do it right now because it takes uh, a couple minutes because it has to make a bunch of API calls. But I can show you what you would get from doing that. <clears throat> and you get uh, a page that looks like this. And there's a couple things to notice about this. First of all, notice that articles, data sets, slides, software, and web pages are all up here as first class citizens, right? I think in the future, we're going to stop fetishizing the article as the only legitimate means of scholarly you know, uh, communication. We're going to start saying, this is one way to tell a story about our scholarship. There's a lot of ways we can do this. We can do a data set, we can do slides, all sorts of different things. Obviously, articles are better in some contexts, blog posts are better in other contexts. But eventually, I think we need to start saying, this is the medium, the message is what we should be caring about. So, the other thing to notice is that we've got these sort of badges up here. So um, this one looks like it's got a lot of badges. This one just looks like it has a couple. So let's investigate that real quick. So Pyramid Symmetry Transforms uh, has been saved, cited, and saved. So blue means scholarly, and green means by the public. We're going to click on this and take a little bit of a closer look. So saved by scholars. So you remember that table I showed you a minute ago. Um, this fits uh, Mendeley into saved by scholars. Uh, you see a 67 to 85 here. What that means is you are in the 67th, uh, this particular article, is in the 67th to 85th percentile compared to all of the other articles indexed in Web of Science in 2007, the year of its publication. So the idea here is you want to compare it to a meaningful reference set. Four readers on Mendeley, is that a lot? Is it a little? Who knows, right? So let's compare it to something that we do know, this random sample of Web of Science indexed articles from 2007. Okay, it turns out you're in this range. The range represents a 95% confidence interval of where your actual percentile would fall. So that's kind of a cool thing, right? Like, kind of gives you a little bit of context so that you don't have to just say, oh, you know, I was in Mendeley. You can actually say, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm not, like, at the very top, but I'm in the top half. That's pretty cool. Same thing with Scopus citations, right? So two citations, you know, for a 2007 article, that's actually not that great. So that puts you in the 23rd, 47th percentile. I mean, you know, it's not terrible, but, you know, you're not really leading the pack. Um, so on this other side, we see the public, right? So again, I can say that was bookmarked by the public. Not many things do get bookmarked by the public, it turned out. So one bookmark actually puts you pretty high in the 98th percentile. So let's look at this one. It's doing a little bit better. So this one has a lot more metrics, right? So this one, 130 readers on Mendeley, that's quite a lot more. Um, so that puts you in the 97th percentile, which is pretty cool. So that's why you get one of these highly badges. If you wanted to look into this and find the provenance of it, you could do that. So let's say, for instance, tweets. 
Who tweeted this? I need some context, right? Two tweets is good. It puts me in the 97th percentile because very few scholarly articles actually get tweeted. But let's find out a little bit more about it. So I'm going to click on that. And you can see there's two tweets here. One of the tweets says, um, I would love to replicate this for building systems. So that sounds like a scientist. That's pretty cool that a scientist is tweeting it and also is interested in replicating the study, which is the kind of thing we, we would like to sort of encourage. Um, and then uh, read about, uh, blah, blah, blah. But here the key is it's Encyclopedia of Life, which is a really cool project that's, um, that's well known and doing really cool things. So here it's not just random tweets, right? It's tweets by people whose opinions kind of actually matter to us. And it's a sign of impact. It's, it, it gives us an ability to tell a more data-driven story about the impact that this particular article is having. Um, here we see data sets. Data sets, we tell the same sort of, we can give you the same sort of information. We can say, this data set has, you know, 1,500 package views. Well, is 1,500 a lot or little? Well, if we can compare it to everything else in the Dryad data repository where this is, we can say, actually, it's in the 97th percentile. This is a, a data set that's being downloaded, it's being looked at quite a lot. Um, it's even getting tweeted about, which is pretty neat, right? People are actually wanting to talk about this data set because it's that interesting. What I love is that if you compare you know, this, uh, this article and this data set, without this information, the, the article is always going to be better, right? When it's come time to evaluation, well, you wrote an article, what's a data set, right? But if you actually have this data in front of you, this impact data, the ability to tell actual data-driven stories about this, these impacts, you can say, well, this is actually probably a bigger deal than the article. Right? I mean, it's the 97th percentile in all these particular areas. People are talking about it. It's got a conversation, right? And so you can start to actually compare things without relying on sort of antiquated measures like the journal impact factor. So that's the gist of impact story, and I, I can show a lot of other stuff, but um, that's the basic idea. Eventually, oh yeah, one other thing I forgot to mention, which I think is pretty cool. Right now, we just, the, the reference set that we're norming against, against the percentiles, is just a random set of web of science. But we have the ability, and we're going to be rolling out soon, the ability to... Uh, to customize reference sets. So what if instead of comparing to just web of science, we compared to, let's say, a mesh term, right? So you could enter in orthopedic surgery and say, compared to all articles written about orthopedic surgery, my article is in the 97th percentile and the number of times the scholars have saved it. Again, we're not saying that this is going to replace citation you know, scores. We think, however, it's a really important um, complement because it gives us the ability to tell this broader story. All right, so back to presentation land. Why out metrics? Why should it? Well, I kind of touched on it a little bit. I think it's a little bit more fair. Um, being able to sort of show the whole picture is really important. Funders are increasingly asking for um, evidence of social engagement from researchers. Um, we can assess impact faster because, right, so tweets happen like that, right? The citation graph takes a really, really long time. Peer review takes a really, really long time. There's a lot of other advantages. But I think the most important one is that if we quantify impact, if we really, you know, it's, we're not quite here yet, but if we, we could imagine a world in which we could have this sort of spectroscope, right? This mass spectroscopy applied to impact, right? <coughs> Bibliometric spectroscopy, where we could actually measure every single spectra, right, of impact. We could say the entire impact story, all numerically quantified. If we could do that, we could teach machines what's important. And that's a really powerful idea. That could really affect the way that we communicate as scholars. And I'll go through this bit a little quickly. Um, I think journals need an upgrade. I think journals are uh, 17th century technology, and that's great. But I think we can do better. I don't think we need to have the best scholarly communication possible using 17th century technology, right? Let's kind of move beyond that. Journals are slow. They're strict in, f in format. They're closed. The quality control is inconsistent. A lot of things make it past peer review that never should. A lot of things don't make it past peer review that clearly should. And it's hard to innovate in journals. Moreover, we don't really use the web. The web was created as a scholarly communication tool by Berners-Lee and CERN, right? And today, the web has gone on to transform everything from the way, you know, we... We buy our groceries to pornography. It's transformed our entire society, and yet it has not transformed scholarly communication. We still do the same kinds of things. It's still based on the journal. We just deliver the journal in sort of a faster horse, right? Like, that's all the web is. We can do a lot better than that, I think. Back in the day, CERN had a list of all the web pages, which I love, right? Just like, oh, here are the web pages, like 200, right? And that seems silly now, but we're actually in the same place with journals. We just have a list of the journals. There's like 25,000 journals. Right? What about 20, why don't I have like 250,000 journals, 250 million, right? Like, why, why even bother with journals? Why not just publish things? So here's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, I wrote an article called The Decoupled Journal, which is sort of about these kinds of ideas. And I submitted it, and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And I said, look, this is kind of like, you know, I like to think sort of cutting edge stuff. The field is moving quickly, right? Like, could we publish this, like, this decade, please? I waited and waited, and they were like, well, you know. So I said, look, I'm just going to, I wrote it on a Google Doc. Can I just make the Google Doc public? And they said, sure, to their credit, the publisher. Um, so I made the Google Doc public, and I tweeted it. 
So this is a you know, picture of the Google. You can still find it probably if you Google it. Um, so this is pre-publication, pre-review copy. Tell me what you think. And I tweeted that to my Twitter followers. Now, there are not very many people in the world who care at all what I do, right? But almost all of them follow me on Twitter, which is pretty handy because when I need to reach the audience of people who care about what I do, I can reach them. I have like you know, maybe 1,500 people or something. So I tweeted this to these 1,500 people and said, hey, hey, look, y'all, like, this is what I'm doing. You might find it interesting or whatever. And the response was awesome. Right? I got all these people adding. Uh, I found all kinds of different references that I didn't even know about that were added to the thing. I mean, that's your peer review, right? Instead of two peer reviewers, why not 1,500? 1,500 people were actually motivated to go look at my, my work and find the errors in it, make it better. And not only that, not only do I get my peer review that way, I also get my dissemination that way. I don't even need the journal. I met a guy who was, who was a big guy in my field and um, was talking, was you know, a little nervous. I'm a graduate student. I was like, hi. You know, like, and uh, I you know, kind of started pitching some of my ideas to him and stuff. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, decoupled journal. I read all about that already. And I was like, how does this guy, oh, the Google Doc. And so it, was, it wasn't very difficult for the thing that I had written because it was you know, at least a little bit interesting to him to find his way to him because I had these dissemination channels. The journal is, again, this pre-web uh, pre mindset, right, where it's an industrial mindset where we say, well, let's bind everything together on paper and we'll give this set of papers to all the people who have this set of interests. But I don't need that anymore. I can reach the people who have my interests very easily. And if I can also add alt metrics to that, right, if I can add metrics to say, of all the things that I published or wrote this year, here are the ones that have found the most interested audience. Here are the ones who have been tweeted, been discussed, been cited. Right? Here are the ones that have been used. Here are the ones that have made an impact. I can put that on my CV just as well as I could put a journal article on my CV, right? I mean, like, the, the, best, the best thing I've ever written, at least in terms of impact, as far as I can tell, someone has been cited like maybe 40 times. That's, that's really excited about that. I'm a graduate student. That's, that's great news for me. It's in a journal with no DOI, a journal with, you know, pretty minimal peer review, but it's making a difference in the world, right? So if we can use alt metrics to tell that story more, Maybe we can move past the sort of slow, sort of methodical approach that journals offer us. So I think the second revolution has actually already started. I think that by the fact that, the fact that we can gather these metrics now means that we're going to have to use them, right? Once you can start seeing, hey, this is how many people talked about this. This is how many people saved this. This is the different audiences that have interacted with this product in these particular ways. Once we have that information, I think it's impossible to ignore. I think the citation graph is the exact same way. Garfield created the citation graph not as an evaluation or measurement tool. He created it as a, as a, um, a search tool, right? It was essentially a, a filtering tool. But once you had the data, it was too useful not to, to use. Peter Winkler says that. He compares it to Chekhov's gun. He says, once you bring it on the stage, it has to be fired. So that concludes my, my it's a different Chekhov, it's a joke. Um, so that concludes my presentation. And I think we're waiting on questions to the end, right? Okay, awesome. Thanks, y'all. Okay, great. Um, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers. Um, this is really a fantastic topic. It's very interesting and very timely. Um, I'm also delighted to be able to participate in the panel because you know these are everybody's doing things that I'm very interested in. So selfishly, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm also excited to share some of the work we've been doing at Becker Medical Library around kind of looking beyond uh, this idea of citations, uh, as Jason mentioned, and looking for true um, indicators of impact and understanding um, true impact and moving, um, moving work forward um, and how it can be measured. So um, just to put things into context, uh, I am at uh, Becker Medical Library at Washington University School of Medicine. The things that I'll be talking today do have a decidedly biomedical slant uh, to them because that's what I do. Uh, a lot of these uh, ideas, though, can be applied for dis different disciplines, and we do have examples of ways that um, other disciplines, such as climate science, um, such as people in the humanities are applying some of the general principles that we've learned to their own work. And so we I encourage you to think about these things uh, with your own perspective and uh, certainly we encourage you to let us know if you have any feedback or if you have any ideas because you know uh, the work is only as good as uh, the least common denominator and so if there are things that need to be added um, or changed we're always open to uh, comments. So 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are in, involved in biomedical research. We do things um, you know, throughout the entire spectrum of biomedical research. Um, we're looking at not only bench discovery, but um, the efficient application of those bench discoveries um, to clinical trials, to, um, to standards of care, and then um, something that results in improved health um, of the community, which is, I think we can all agree, um, probably the best outcome of biomedical research. So when we look at tracking and evaluation and trying to understand, you know, kind of impact in this realm, um, we look at measuring certain things. So certainly we're looking at the amount of grant dollars that are coming in, things like patents, and then citations. Uh, citations uh, for published articles are a significant output, um, and they're very easy to count. And so a lot of what we do has been built around that. Um, however, I think that um, it probably goes without saying that that may not be the best indicator of the kinds of things that are really happening and where the most impactful work is happening. Things like papers uh, end up being uh, placeholders or artifacts um, from real work. And as Jason alluded to, you know, some of the most significant um, interactions or modes of dissemination for your work can happen behind the scenes. They happen at a conference when you're speaking to a policymaker. Um, they happen through email when you're setting up a new collaboration. So. Um, a lot has been done uh, on the topic of author, article, and journal level metrics. Um, it's, I think it's very tempting to use these metrics as a straightforward way to assign value or worth to a researcher um, for scholarly efforts or even um, trying to rank journals. Um, and I think that these metrics are very helpful in understanding research efforts or understanding um, the relative worth of certain kinds of research outputs. They absolutely cannot be considered in a vacuum. Um, so I think to understand the true impact of research, uh, the metrics that are derived from publication data need to be supplemented with indicators that demonstrate tangible outcomes. So for instance, in our realm, we're looking at clinical implementation or benefit to the community, influence on legislation or policy, and then certainly economic benefit is a big one, um, especially in this post-era funding um, uh, time where we're looking at uh, the effect of stimulus awards. Publication data alone does not provide a full narrative of research impact, and it is not predictive of meaningful health outcomes. So um, we want to think about going beyond the metrics. And what I'm going to talk to you for the rest of the time today is a model. It's a library-based um, model for assessing research impact called the Becker model. Um, the Becker model serves as a framework to quantify and document research impact based on research outputs and activities, and we also have a number of resources available uh, to help you do this. Um, so we have um, uh, reporting information, we have guidelines, we have glossaries, and a number of other things available, um, including um, strategies for enhancing research impact, and we'll talk a little bit more about these later. So um, I could not talk about this work without talking about uh, the two women who are primarily responsible for even heading down this path in the first place. Uh, so on the left, you have uh, Dr. May Gordon, who is one of our faculty members at Washington University. May is the PI of a study called the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study, and had gone to a meeting and um, had seen a poster on citation reports, and had come back into the library and talked to my colleague Kathy Sarley, who is indicated on the right, and said, hey, I saw this. I'd like to know a little bit more about citation reports. Um, and Kathy said, no problem. Piece of cake, we can do that for you. Um, and so the question is, you know, can we perform this citation analysis of 26 peer-reviewed journal articles generated by this OATS study, um, and to understand how many times they had been cited in subsequent publications. So um, I think that probably this audience is very familiar with what citation analysis is. Um, for those of you who may not, um, citation analysis is a very traditional tool used in academia. We're looking at um, how many times a document or a group of documents have been cited by subsequent publications. Um, you can consider the publications or these citations, publications are indica indicative of productivity in science, or we think of it that way. And then the citations are a way of judging quality um, of that output. Um, and there's this inherent assumptions that significant documents will demonstrate a high citation count, but I think it's fair to say that these numbers do not necessarily uh, tell the best story. 
Um, the numbers don't indicate uh, whether you have had um, a, a um, output that has gone on to inspire um, further funding opportunities. Um, it does not show um, outputs that are such things as medical devices or survey instruments or other things that are real practical tools that are used in the academic environment and beyond. Um, this is a fabulous quote. So it is no longer enough to measure what we can. We need to measure what matters. Um, but the, you know, the, the, here's the important part. How do we measure what matters? How do we determine that and how do we find it? And it is uh, by no means an easy task. So we, po we put forward a hybrid solution. Um, so we're looking at uh, something that uh, takes into account citation analysis and moves it forward. Um, so this Becker model involves tracking research mm -hmm. outputs um, that have been disseminated and diffused to locate indicators that demonstrate evidence of research impact. So the Becker model is a logic model. Um, it, we focus on outcomes specific to biomedical research, um, bench and clinical. As I mentioned, we do have a number of people who are using the model in their own environments and in their own disciplines, and they're making adjustments as needed uh, for, for those um, specific differences. Uh, the outcomes are grouped into pathways based on stages of the research process, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. And it, the indicators serve as specific examples, um, or indicators that serve as specific examples of impact are noted with outcomes. Um, this is an outcome evaluation, um, and it, we focus on outputs and outcomes, and we, um, it, it, we think it's especially important that we include unintended effects to judge program effectiveness, because I think we are all familiar um, with the idea that sometimes the most wonderful outputs are those that are the most unintended. So. Um, I mentioned pathways. We do have um, some specific pathways. Now this is um, highly relevant to our particular environment, but um, I would encourage you to think about your own environment. So um, advancement of knowledge is a big one. Um, we have clinical implementation, legislation and policy enactment, economic benefit, and community benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a an, uh, screenshot of the project website. Um, the URL for the website is listed below. Mm -hmm. As you can notice up in the upper right-hand corner, um, there is a link to the model. Um, we also have, let me see if I can see my, oh, there it is. Um, there are uh, guidelines on how to use it, um, guidelines for enhancing research impact, and then information and further resources that can support this kind of activity. Um, you know, we're excited to have something that's based in the library. You know, we feel very strongly that the library um, has a number of good resources and also a good perspective of, of an understanding of, um, of information and information structure. And also, um, we, I think, uh, by our nature, most of us who are in the library world um, really enjoy a good puzzle and finding things. And so um, it, it seems like a wonderful marriage of um, skills, talents, and resources. So the Becker model, uh, as I mentioned, it, we provide a supplement to publication analysis. Well, we do this in order to provide a more robust view of um, research outputs and understanding what's happening in the biomedical um, research um, environment. Um, in the Becker model, we have reporting templates. Um, we have a completed report so that you can see what something looks like when it's done. Um, glossaries of resources and terms, um, examples, um, lots of supplemental information. We have some readings, so if you just cannot get enough uh, reading about uh, research impact, we've got a number of things listed there, um, you know, which can also help to put things in perspective. Uh, what we've tried to do is establish a very straightforward uh, framework for um, understanding the diffusion of research outputs and activities and um, mm -hmm. uh, guidelines to help you understand um, and identify those indicators that show true research impact. Um, we're very interested on in doing this on a couple of different levels. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at this on the individual mm -hmm. level, um, certainly for the individual mm -hmm. scholar, um, as well as the um, core and institutional level as well. Can you, let's see, okay. <laughs> okay, um, so, uh, 
And uh, let's see, okay, so guidance for quantifying and documenting research impact. And then we also have a number of strategies for en enhancing the impact of research. So this is something that's uh, very, um, very important to our junior faculty, um, our scholars, and then certainly even mid-career and, um, and highly established faculty are always interested in enhancing um, their, their own impact within their field. So I mentioned um, uh, evidence of research impact. Um, so here are some examples in um, biomedicine uh, which have been separated out by those pathways. So advancement of knowledge. You know, here we're looking at things that cannot be found by um, mere citation analysis alone. So advancement of knowledge, we're looking at a license agreement granted for the use of intellectual property generated by a research study. So if you license a survey instrument, that's, you know, that's meaningful. Um, that shows that that, um, that the, um, the knowledge that you've gained um, is being applied in, in subsequent uh, uh, projects. Clinical implementation, a good way to know if, um, if something is being used in the clinical environment is, um, is if it, there is a way of documenting that it's happening in the clinical environment. So these CPT codes are a good uh, indicator of that. Um, certainly in medicine, if there's a way of indicating uh, that uh, something needs to be paid for, so if there are billing codes, um, that's a really good indicator that it's happening in the clinical environment. Um, legislation and policy enactment, we have architectural guidelines for design and construction of healthcare facilities. You will not find this in a, um, in a, in a citation, economic benefit um, and communi community benefit as well. Um, so, so going back to Dr. Gordon's OATS study, here are the things that we found um, as a result of digging deeper past the citations. You can see we have interventions, continuing education materials, those CPT codes, changes in delivery of practice, uh, guidelines, new research studies, so that's money coming in to the institution based on that work. Measurement instruments, uh, diagnostic criteria, new standards of care, and curriculum guidelines. So these are all things that are not going to be readily uh, discernible from citation analysis alone. However, when you are that faculty member and you're able to show that, you know, this is the impact I've had in my field, I mean, this is a very powerful story um, for funding agencies, for promotion and tenure committees, and so on. So this is um, a very lovely quote from May, um, uh, where she, uh, which she included in the final report to the NIH. Um, she said that um, she had anecdotal evidence of the OATS study impact, but she wondered if quantitative independent indicators were available. Without the thorough analysis recommended by the Becker model for assessment of research impact, we would never have realized just how far reaching the impact of our research has been. So um, we apply the Becker model, you know, certainly to individuals, to um, groups on our campus, um, and one of those groups um, with which we have a lot of work um, is our Institute of Clinical and Translational Sciences, or ICTS. Um, this is uh, funded by a Clinical and Translational Science Award from the NIH to Washington University um, in order to promote translational medicine. Um, and both Kathy Sarley and I are members of the Tracking and Evaluation Program. Our Tracking and Evaluation, or T&E program, is um, comprised of members who come from a, a variety of backgrounds. So we have folks who are, um, uh, you know, qualitative and quantitative assessment, um, certainly bibliometrics, network science, um, surveys, um, and so on. So we're all bringing in um, our own background and our own expertise. And we're using the Becker model to understand how we can highlight some of the work of our investigators and understand what that true impact um, of that funding uh, from ICTS has been. How does it align with our goals? Um, for ICTS, um, how, um, how does this work help us um, uh, plan, um, uh, strategic planning, um, uh, understanding changes or developments in a field, and so on. And also, how do things align with the, the national consortium as well? So uh, again, biomedical research enterprise, so everything is kind of biomedical in nature. Um, and the things that we're tracking, um, we've tried to put into uh, kind of an easy to understand um, framework. Uh, this may be difficult to see from the back of the room, but what we've done is we've actually mapped research processes and outputs um, on the bottom in the root system of the tree. 
Um, so we're looking at outputs um, you know, that are very common. So yes, we do have peer-reviewed articles, but we also have things like software and data sets and book chapters and blogs and wikis and all of those ways that you disseminate, um, you have outputs that, that can uh, allow you to disseminate um, the results of your findings. Um, that information is diffused out into the tree um, where we see these pathways for research impact. So these are these true indicators that we do have impact. Things uh, that we saw in the earlier slide um, like clinical guidelines, legislation, medical billing codes, policy enactment, and so on. So this is not all sunshine and rainbows. This is not, um, you know, it is not uh, a, a something that can be done if you have 30 minutes to kill some afternoon. <laughs> um, it, uh, there, there are some issues. Um, so certainly, it's not a linear process. It can be quite frustrating at times because you do need to go beyond uh, the biomedical research, be, beyond those uh, indices. There is a time lag between research discovery and translational applications, which is something um, this translational application is we're very interested in. How long is that time lag? Well, it kind of depends. So, you know, you may not have the most impactful work come out um, for years and years after a study, or you could have something really interesting happen shortly thereafter. Um, optimal time frame for starting assessment is unknown. Uh, supporting documentation may not be publicly available. Um, you know, so I know Kathy's made a number of calls, you know, to uh, a number of entities that you, you know, to try and dig up uh, this information. And sometimes it can be uh, difficult to establish a direct correlation from a specific research output. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Uh, you know, I think we all understand why does research impact matter. You know, you want more funding. You want to be able to disseminate your, inf your ideas um, and have an impact on your field. Um, you want to see how other people are using your work and using your ideas and building upon them. I mean, that's the, the true beauty of, of scholarship, I think. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, at um, the m more um, nitty-gritty level, um, tenure and promotion activities are a significant effort. So I found this cartoon. It says, based on these ROI calculations you've provided, Davis, I say, yes, you can go to the bathroom. So sometimes it feels like that. You know, you have to uh, accomplish so many things just to, you know, get the very bare minimum things done. So um, this, this is obviously an important thing. Research impact is important. So I mentioned we do have some strategies for enhancing research impact. Um, you know, we think improving access and retrieval to your research is the surest way to enhance its research impact. Um, we have outlined um, several dozen um, suggestions um, that have been divided into three categories. So we have preparing for publication, dissemination, and keeping track of your research. And we suggest repetition, consistency, and an awareness of the intended audience. Um, uh, to keep that in mind uh, when you're looking at, um, at, at your own work within your field. Um, so there are a number of different ways that you can build your pathways to impact. This information is available on our website. Um, so I will not uh, go into it, but you can see that there are some good suggestions. Certainly cultivate champions um, is a big one. Make sure and, uh, you know, take advantage of those human connections. Be opportunistic, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with this um, for looking for opportunity. Um, and give presentations and talk about your work as much as possible in a variety of different situations. I, I also think um, that we cannot emphasize strongly enough, the value of curating oneself. So, um, you know, we take care of a number of different things um, in our lives. And we may have um, special collections. Um, we may have things um, in our personal lives or even in the library. We have things that we are um, caretakers of. We need to be caretakers of our, of our scholarly reputation. And um, to me, the most significant thing that you can do is to be proactive. So think about this. Every time you talk to somebody or give a significant presentation, write it down. Every time you have a way of um, disseminating information, keep note of it. I mean, it could be something as, um, as old-fashioned as a file folder. Um, it could be uh, taking advantage of, story, of uh, impact story and, and similar, um, similar platforms to try and understand um, how that work is being used. Um, and I think that if your institution provides researcher profiles, um, you as an investigator or, um, or as someone who is supporting that work needs to make sure that, um, that investigators are putting their best foot forward, maintaining, um, you know, uh, up-to-date 
um, information about themselves. And you know, most institutions are moving to these, um, and so you may want to talk to your own institution and see what they have available. Um, uh, there are just so that everybody knows what I'm talking about, there are a couple of them that are very well used. Um, Vivo, which is something that I'm involved with. Um, there's also um, profiles out of Harvard University and um, Elsevier's Cybal experts um, are some common ones. So we do have a number of resources available. Um, we have the original paper all the way back in 2010. Um, there are also some uh, collections of references um, uh, available on Zotero um, and the website. And then I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge um, my partner in crime, Kathy Sarley, um, who, with whom I have a wonderful collaboration. Um, we work together on a number of projects, um, but by far the research impact work has been um, the most educational for me um, coming from a non-library background. I've learned an awful lot. Um, and um, also our Washington University Institute of Clinical and Translational Science, as well as the Becker Medical Library and our colleagues there. If you have additional questions, you're more than welcome to uh, contact me. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, funding, um, uh, funding that I have um, with our Institute of Clinical and Translational Sciences. So thank you. So thank you uh, very much for, to the organizers, especially um, Catherine Pope and Andrew yeah. Gelman for moderating and the Scholarly Communications Program for hosting this. Um, this has been very exciting and one, uh, what I'd like to contribute to uh, the discussion of impact story and the Becker model um, is to share um, some views of how decision makers in um, academia are using scholarly metrics or consuming scholarly metrics, kind of a snapshot of the, the state of, blank, state of play um, and some of the barriers to adoption of some of these, I think, fantastic models that are emerging. Um, so my presentation has four parts, but it's, it's not very long. Don't be afraid. Um, I'll stage set uh, first. I'm also a, someone who has a background in tr uh, philosophy and history. Um, by contrasting a, a visionary physicist's view of the true aim of research with the, um, uh, the dilemma which inevitably comes from um, the, the uh, building up of knowledge um, uh, and with, with which everyone has to grapple. Uh, I'll then layer onto that dynamic the realities of the practice of research, um, uh, which of course involves money, power, and control. And then I'll drill down into specifics and share perspectives from practitioners who use metrics, both traditional and alt, as well as peer-based measures of assessment. And we'll look at what people feel works, what doesn't work, what holds promise, and what are the either real or perceived barriers to adoption. And then lastly, I'll briefly touch upon some ongoing work in the altmetric space by colleagues at Digital Science. Um, so I'm going to apologize in advance for reading um, some of these slides, but I think that they're uh, reading from the slides, but I think that they're so well-crafted and honed um, and they really set the stage perfectly um, and, to, and, and articulating the problem. Uh, so th first, the visionary physicist's uh, articulation of, of the problem. We have inherited from our forefathers the keen longing for a unified, all-embracing knowledge. The very name given to the highest institutions of learning reminds us that from antiquity and throughout many centuries, the universal aspect has been the only one giving full credit. We feel clearly that we are now only beginning to acquire reliable material for welding together the sum total of all that is known into a whole, but on the other hand, it has become next to impossible for a single mind to fully command more than just more than a small specialized portion of it. Um, any uh, venture, anyone want to venture? The author, Erwin um, Schrödinger of Schrödinger's Wave Equation fame, um, wrote, wrote this in 1944 in his remarkable book *What Is Life*. He contrasts the practice of science, which is largely about unifying. We unify data, um, perhaps in the context of an experiment, uh, into a hypothesis. We unify um, uh, 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 multiple experiments into a theory. Um, and uh, however, of course, amassing all of that data inevitably leads to information overload, which of course I dare say has only exploded since 1944. Um, we need metrics, um, be they traditional or altmetric or peer review, because we cannot be universally expert. And layered on top of this tension between the unif unif unified 
vision and the realities of, of being able to comprehend is, of course, uh, the realities and practicalities of doing research, which involves funding and money and control and power, as beautifully articulated by the Princeton sociologist Paul Starr um, in his work. And again, I'll just read this one last slide. The Dream of Reason, a uh, great opening for a book. The Dream of Reason did not take power into account. Uh, the Dream of Reason was that reason in the form of the arts and sciences would liberate humanity from scarcity and the caprices of nature, ignorance and superstition, tyranny, and not least of all the diseases of the body and spirit. But reason is no abstract force pus pushing in or in in exorbitantly towards the greater freedom at the end of history. Its forms and uses are determined by the narrower purposes of men and women. Their interests and ideals shape even what counts as knowledge. And I think in the context of what we've been talking about today, what counts as knowledge is as relevant now, certainly, as it was in uh, several decades ago. So at the same time that um, we have this tension between uni unity and comprehension, we have um, these virtues of reasons, these ideals of reasons, and then the realities of our um, narrower interests, um, you know, more, uh, more respect, more um, uh, uh, higher rankings of your institute, uh, you know, more citations, um, more influence. Um, and so uh, this is a bit of a stage setting, but I want to come down to the ground and look in vivo, as it were, at some of the practitioners um, of research assessment um, to see how people are grappling with some of these tensions. Um, so uh, we have actually here um, a great uh, contrast of those two, uh, those two uh, tensions where on the one hand you have the ideal, namely uh, uh, science is now a vast global enterprise um, as articulated by John Sexton, the president of NYU in the uh, uh, October issue of Scientific American, an exemplar of the ideal um, sort of uh, expertise and talent trumping national identity. On the other hand, you have side by side with it um, the inevitable rankings and ratings that people are so fond of. Um, so my, my team at Digital Science um, built the data set and the visualization uh, that uh, accompanied these articles. Um, and they, I think they nicely contrast and compare those, those two tensions. Um, and so, uh, you know, people are very compelled by by rankings and ratings and, and metrics, um, uh, and and, uh, and and grapple yet with uh, uh, with wanting to push forward with a, with more of an ideal. So, uh, let's look at some of, some of the practitioners um, of science. So, in the course of my work at Digital Science, I speak with a lot of um, research administrators and officers and decision makers at scientific research organizations, deans and chancellors and provosts and chief scientific officers and research strategy heads and so forth. And I'm interested in the inputs which feed into um, the decisions uh, that these leaders make at their universities. And these are the power decisions, right? These are allocating resources, capital investments, um, institute building, strategic and opportunistic recruiting, promotion and tenure, maintaining, upgrading, and staffing core facilities, um, information systems, and so forth. Now, it will probably not come as a surprise to you that citation metrics have rightfully or wrongfully um, earned a, a bit of a love-hate relationship. Everyone uses them to varying degrees, but most people do so with at least some, um, some grudging, uh, their concerns falling into these major categories. Uh, I won't read all the quotes, but mainly the delays that um, uh, are, by definition, a citation is retrospective. It may not reflect, reflect current faculty if it's in an institutional level. Um, the lack of context, the fact that citations vary widely across, uh, across domains. Citations for radio astronomy is very different from citations in the AIDS research community. Um, and that it, the focus is on quality, uh, so, sorry, quantity rather than quality. Um, and of course, a citation doesn't distinguish between a negative and a positive citation at, at its very core. Um, looking at alt metrics, and alt metrics is so it's such a young and fresh um, uh, idea. Uh, it has a lot of promise and opportunity, but also, of course, hurdles. Um, and so here are some examples of um, what, people, what people are grappling with in actually using altmetrics to make decisions at universities. Um, and so these, these, I think, are worth uh, uh, reading. So um, from a uh, 
provost in, in, in Massachusetts, we hear if someone is producing non-traditional outputs, we've heard, we've heard a lot about that with the Becker model, non-traditional outputs at the core of their work, data set software, we rely on peer letters to evaluate the impact and import of those efforts. We are essentially relying on alternative measures of impact just as heavily, if not more heavily, than rely on citation metrics. So this um, provost is um, actually putting peer reviews, uh, peer review letters, letters of support in the tenuring process in the same category as, as alt metrics and that they're not, uh, you know, a traditional citation based measure. Um, and from a chief editor at a Nature Research Journal, most people in the community realize that impact factors are not really a meaningful way of assessing research quality and that an article based metric will be useful but alt metrics as a concept is not yet part of the mainstream where it is difficult to find senior scientists on social networks in the first place and then inevitably I hear alongside that but this might be a generational issue. Um, the phrase de generational issue or digital native inevitably comes up when I, when I hear people talk about alt metrics that uh, we know it's coming, we know that people that are born digital um, are this is how they communicate but we're not there yet or many of our um, faculty members aren't there yet. And lastly, and I highlight this one because I think it, it points to a potential way forward, um, academic buy-in, so from a, a head of strategy at a UK university, academic buy-in into altmetrics as being a serious tool will depend on the robustness of underlying data and academic judgment. Let me rephrase it, altmetric peer review. I know peer review and social media are opposite terms in a way, but getting those closely aligned, according to my view, is the key to success of altmetrics as a proper research impact tool, in addition to being a nice-to-have tool by itself for information only. Um, so I think that this is uh, a complementary to what we've been hearing um, about the tools that are available and that um, uh, researchers and administrators can use um, and uh, how, how administrators are beginning to use these tools and think about these tools and, and the hurdles and the challenges. Um, so in summary, um, I think that common concerns about citation metrics um, uh, we're probably all pretty familiar with them. Um, everyone is in agreement that we need more, a wider definition of what impact means. Um, I think that there's a lot of excitement and promise around alt metrics. Um, it's real time, it's more inclusive, um, and it's, uh, we're, it's easier to track these digital signatures and footprints um, uh, of the of conversations and of, of alternate uh, outputs. Um, I think some of the challenges are, um, that I've been hearing are really understanding what the inputs are to um, some of the aggregators and the platforms um, uh, and what if, if there's any kind of hierarchy there um, apart from uh, this, what you might have in your head that say you know a, a Wikipedia citation is more important than uh, some, uh, you know some blog um, and then lastly um, what are the norms in interpreting that all, all those altmetric uh, data points and I think having kind of reference, uh, reference data sets is, is, is going to go a long way in helping people understand how to interpret the data. Um, and, and very, very lastly, I'd like to um, mention, I have a colleague at Digital Science UN80 um, who has built a versatile tool to measure attention at the article level reflected by inclusion in reference managers, um, reference in traditional media and social media activity. Um, you can use this tool for free by visiting altmetric.it um, and we have a number, he has a number of institutional and commercial clients subscribing to um, his, more, his commercial venture altmetric.com um, which any institute can trial freely. Um, Ewan is, he's a computer scientist by training and he spent a lot of time working in laboratories um, and he, he really encapsulates what digital science is trying to do which is to use technology in a very creative, um, effective and inventive way to um, make scientific research um, more efficient. Um, and you can reach out to you and if you have any questions about um, his, his tools um, by email or Twitter. Um, and so on behalf of everyone at Digital Science, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. So now is your chance to ask questions. Um, I, I want to say, I want, I want to put in a plug um, for, for blogging. I mean, uh, tweeting is, is, is great. I mean, somebody programmed my blog to auto-tweet the blog entry, so that, that's fine. Um, I loved all three talks. It, I had so many questions and comments. I have about 18 questions, and I'm not allowed to ask all 18 myself. I think I'm allowed to ask one or two because I showed up here to, to moderate. Um, 
also in case people are, you know, afraid of, of going up themselves. But the only way to, to have 18 questions is to write a blog post. I can't write a research article saying I have 18 questions about this. I don't want to send 18 Twitters, uh, tweets. Um, so, yeah, it's good to have multiple, um, multiple approaches. I'm looking forward to, to writing the blog and then I'm um, hoping that I get some comments. And I'd say also that there is, there is something still missing in the world of blog comments because it seems like there's a lot of people who would like to comment, but it, it seems like such a big thing for someone to comment on the blog. It's, it's difficult. But yet tweeting, I don't think it's enough. I, I enjoy when my blog entries get tweeted because it makes me feel better, but then people don't really add that much to the, to the discussion. So there are, I know there are some online forums where people can do the equivalent of a blog comment and get credit for it. They don't get tenure for a blog comment, but they get plus one on it and, and all that. Those things are great, um, although I guess they're not fully integrated. I want to ask the organizer about this. Are, are the three presentations going to be somewhere? Because I need to link to them. So I don't want to say to link to them separately. It would be nice if they're, they're going to all be in one place, right? Yeah. Okay, great. We'll glad glad we'll to hear that. Scholarly communication okay. slides. <laughs> so, um, I want to ask just one of my 18 questions and then the rest of you can ask. Um, in, Jason talked about, he drew an analogy which we hear a lot of, which that things like tweets or, or blogging or preprints are sort of like scholarly communications and the model is, the, the paradigm is, is letters or scientific articles. I wonder whether we also have to think of journalism as a model. And I mean this not merely in the commonplace idea that, um, you know, blogs kill the journalism star kind of thing, but, but also that if you look at who are popular tweeters and bloggers, it's sort of a mix of, let's say, people who are respected for their research and have branched out in that area, people maybe like Jason who are young enough to have started there and are, are respected in that realm. Um, but then you also have people who are like celebrities who get lots of followers and, and also people who are maybe, they're, the, the good side is people who might not be deep academic researchers but are really good bloggers, really good tweeters. They're really good at that. These, these people who are famous for, for linking who are blog celebrities because they, they, they can sort of think well at that length even if they haven't done a lot of scholarly work. Um, but as I said then that the sort of the bad part is then there are people who are just trolls who basically get a lot of hits and, and like that. And in a way, like, I, I just think that we have to think of some of those people as being a sort of version of a journalist, people who are trying to get a reputation by entertaining or attracting attention, which isn't so horrible. I mean, people click to a troll, they must get some enjoyment out of it. It's, um, but I just, I wonder what you think about that, like that whether, like I'm, I'm just uh, wondering about, because you're sort of continually saying, well, this is the extension instead of Isaac Newton, you know, writing a letter and, and so forth. It's, it's all this stuff, but if you go out into the world of tweets and blogs, what you have is at the top of the heap, you have a lot of people who are essentially journalists. Some who are good at it and some are bad at it. So we're blurring the lines in, in other ways. I'm wondering if you have a comment on that. Sure. Um, so I think being a scholar is a job that comprises a wide variety of skills. Um, one of those skills, and depending on, on the job, you might have some of those skills in greater uh, or lesser measure. Um, so some scholars, I want to look at you, but then the microphone can't hear me. You can look out. Um, so some scholars, uh, I think, are particularly gifted communicators. Others might be particularly gifted uh, theoreticians. Others might be uh, gifted methodologists, uh, gifted experimenters, and so on. Um, I often think of an uh, academic department, something like that, as a sort of, you know, sports team, like say a football team. I think Unfortunately, a lot of administrators have fallen into the trap of trying to build a football team out of all quarterbacks. They say, well, the quarterback's the most important player in the team. Clearly, we want 11 of those. Um, but that's not realistic. I think we want to have some researchers who are 
you know, getting published in Nature all the time. I think we want to have some researchers who are getting published in the New York Times all the time, um, who are really good at articulating why their research is valuable and why it makes a difference. Um, most of what we do is funded by taxpayers, and my feeling, I think a lot of people share this, is that we have a responsibility to articulate that clearly, cogently, and meaningfully to the people who are paying for the research. Um, I guess that has some commonalities to journal journalism, but I think science communication is, I wouldn't necessarily characterize it entirely as journalism, and I think it's great to be able to build a football team that has, you know, a quarterback and also, uh, you know, a fullback. I think I want to build an academic department that has a person who's really good at experiments, another person who's really good at communication. That seems like a, a good thing to me. That's fascinating, yeah. I and mean, that's a wonderful response um, because it definitely links into, into that idea of um, the challenge of hiring somebody who's good at teaching, for example, or good at communication. It's, okay. So uh, come to the mic with your questions, because if you don't, I'm going to keep asking my own. Um, <laughs> I knew that would get you up. Okay. I just wanted to ask the panelists if they perceive um, a danger in uh, advancing alt metrics as a series of additional proxies that are kind of reductions of actual context. So as we have, you know, more metrics to rely on, and we need them because uh, because they, they act as a necessary proxy, are we? I think it's it's part of that central tension between wanting to participate uh, and 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 being able to comprehend. Um, I, I I from what from the conversations I've had with uh, administrators who use metrics, it's just it's. It's just bloody necessary. Um, uh, in fact, more so in biomedical research than in in any other domain. Um, there's just such a a specialization. You may know the entire cardiology field, but you don't know infectious disease and oncology. Um, and in order to have a and, and and at the same time, there's a trend, a, 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 which I'm sure we're, we're all uh, aware of, and but no one really touched on in their talk for there to be interdisciplinary science, right? So you have more of a drive, more of a need to be a more of a, a polymath researcher. And so um, there are, you know, those tensions exist. And um, I think one of the advantages of altmetrics is it helps connect experts. and helps connect them in very casual, human, conversational ways, um, less formal, um, more um, curbside, as, as is the, the phrase in medical, medical uh, I need to cur have a curbside with you and consult with you about this issue. It's outside of my domain of expertise. Um, and I think Altmetrics helps engender more of those casual encounters among experts, which I think is good for interdisciplinary science. I, if I can um, follow on that, I also think that when you're looking at some of these web-based services that allow us to more easily aggregate information about how people are using our outputs. I, I think that that can be, I mean, it's incredibly helpful. Um, so the things that I talked about that, you know, you're digging up are definitely not available in the citation or in any kind of citation information. However, how do you know what rock to uncover? How do you know what rabbit hole to go down? You know, and, and these can be really good indicators of, of where there might be an interesting story. So, and, and can help to supplement the story. So I think that, you know, everything is very complementary. I do think it requires a kind of a multi-pronged, uh, you know, approach to be able to accomplish this kind of work. Yeah, I don't have much to add to the good answers, but um, I would add, I, I like they use the phrase reward reductionism because I think that's, that's a key concept in what we're doing here, right? Science as an enterprise, right, has this sort of conceit that we can measure things, uh, that we can reduce things to numbers. And of course we miss things when we do that. And so I don't think the alt metrics or any kind of metrics is going to tell the entirety or, uh, of the story, show the entirety of the picture in the same way that science can't you know, tell the same story that a painting or a poem or something else does. But I think it's also really powerful. I think most of us in this room probably buy that 
measuring things and doing science on them can be powerful. And I think if we're going to do that, and as Caitlin points out, we really have to. It's not even a choice. Right? I mean, these things are going to have to be reduced to numbers. We might as well do it well. And the current status is basically, you know, um, we're doing astronomy with, uh, with our eyeballs. Right? That's the impact factor. What we need to do is create telescopes, right? create these sort of uh, tools, the equipment that we can use to do actually really precise, exact, useful, broad, nuanced measurements. I think we're at the very, very beginnings of that, but it has a lot of potential. What really struck me was um, the comment about the generational shift, um, because it seems to me that a lot of what you're measuring, and not you necessarily, Christy, but uh, the Jason, and, um, that, that what you're measuring is actually a lot of discussions happening on that um, the grad student junior faculty, uh, younger researcher side level. I wonder if you guys want to comment on that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great comment, and it's something that we wondered a lot, um, like, uh, you know, when we started doing this. So we said, well, let's do a study for it. Um, so we did a, a, a sample of five uh, sort of representative universities in the U.S. and U.K., got all of the people who, uh, all the grad students, faculty, and postdocs who are associated with those universities, so we had about 10,000 people. And then we searched for all of them on Twitter. We said, well, let's see who, how many of these people are tweeting, um, and what, what do they tweet about? So we did content analysis of the sample of the tweets. And uh, we found the generational gap is not what one might expect. In fact, um, uh, graduate students, or we've lumped graduate students and postdocs in one non-faculty category, and non-faculty were not any more likely to, uh, to tweet than faculty were. The only actual big difference that we found was that faculty were rather more likely to tweet about scholarly things, so tweet about their work, tweet about papers, that sort of thing. Um, so about 30% of mean, and quite a lot of variance, but the mean, uh, about 30% of scholar tweets were, uh, of, sorry, faculty tweets were scholarly, and then only about 15% of graduate students' tweets were, um, were scholarly. So actually faculty are a little bit overrepresented. Um, we didn't have data on the age of the faculty, so that's tough to say, but we were encouraged by that. We also looked at disciplines, and we saw that in five sort of super disciplinary categories, there were not major differences in uh, the usage or how Twitter was used. So it's a really good question, at least in the case of Twitter, I found those results encouraging to suggest that we might be getting sort of a broader cross sample of the scholarly popu population. I'll say that's a bad yeah, no, no, it's, it's interesting. Inevitable question. Have you published a study, Jason? Oh yeah, good question. Uh, there's a poster of it that's online, it's pretty easy to find. It's on my C V and uh, it should be published in JSIST presently. Thanks. I was wondering, uh, uh, Maybe Christy and Jason would talk to us. You might have something to say too, Teresa, about the response versus of actually trying to get faculty or students. Um, maybe the difference there's the old, the generation discussion, um, obviously, but uh, just the kind of responses you've gotten, kind of like on the ground, rolling it out. I just I'm working with a huge group of faculty and students, and I'm trying to convince of exactly this. So I'd like to hear about your experiences doing that. Thanks. Um. So yeah, so it's, it's really it's so fascinating to be talking about Twitter, and these discussions tend to end up there because it's sort of like the litmus test, it's the, the thing that people really stick on because they, uh, it's so um, e ephemeral and unimportant and unprofessional for people who aren't associated with that community, and for the people who are associated with the community, it's so central and valuable and important. And so it's a good question, and, and I tend to find that there's such a bimodal distribution, it's hard for the two sides to talk to each other sometimes, Sometimes I, something I found useful is sharing the things that Twitter has accomplished for me. So like being able to sort of informally publish my stuff has been really useful. I've created a number of different, um, I've gotten involved in a number of different workshops and uh, um, what's the word, uh, panels. Panels, I've, I've formed a panel on Twitter. Someone tweeted, I was like, hey, want to do a panel on this topic? And I was there, so I was able to find all that stuff. So if you're interested in, if your question, and maybe I misunderstood is, is there good evidence for why people might find oh, Twitter Oh, there is useful? evidence. I was just wondering how you're making it convincing. Oh, I got like you, Like maybe yeah. did you, I, like what, when I heard that, I was like, great, I'd love to watch a video on you. I would show a video on you to every faculty member yeah. I have to work on. Like that story you told, that was great. great. I was just wondering if you do things like that or if you tried. Like the data visualization, like we're usually using data visualization, like that's so gripping. 
Um, just wondering, like, kind of things that kind of catch their eye. It's super field dependent, too, right? I mean, like, there has to be a critical mass. So in my right. field, I talk about scholarly communication, so there's a lot of people communicating. So it's really, you know, it works well. <laughs> Computational biologists, they tend to be pretty um, computationally minded, and so right. they're pretty dense on Twitter. Digital humanities, like, there aren't any digital humanities people that aren't on Twitter, right? Right. right. Whereas other fields, like dentistry, right, they're not, they're not generally on, like, the cutting edge, and so if there's nobody there, there's nobody there, right? I mean, the it's sort of a network edge, effect thing. That was good, yeah. I think also with Twitter, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a diesel engine. You really need to get, you can't just tweet and then step back and say, okay, what now, what do I do? Right, right. You have to have a following, and you have to, it's, it's really about, um, Engaging with a community, mm -hmm. and as you were saying earlier, Jason, um, having knowing your audience and and um, have, you know being able to reach out to that audience and having audience feedback. So I, I think maybe because it is so easy, there's this expectation. Well, I just I just tweet and that that's it. That's mm -hmm. that's just the beginning. It's it's actually you only really get the benefit I think of the entire network and the system if you build up a following and you follow other people. Totally. And that that activation energy puts some people off. Yeah. yeah. And and I think it's also a, that's a really good point. It's a characteristic of the medium too. People think of it as little blog posts and it's not. And in many ways it's not publishing at all. Right. It's a conversational medium. And so as you say, like if you go to a you know, room like this, right, like a conference or whatever, people expect that they have to you know, network, right? They have to work the room, they have to go talk to people. Sometimes people won't want to talk to them, sometimes people will. Like, but it's an active thing. You're trying to build conversations around things. Right. And I think what's so compelling and interesting about Twitter from a metrics perspective is we never would have had a chance to listen to something that low level, that kind of conversational activity. That's what's so exciting about it. Yeah. Blog posts are really exciting too, but they're not so fundamentally different from articles. Right. You're making an argument, you know, I mean, it's more informal and they're totally awesome, but being able to actually have a conversation and have it leave a trace is, I think, what's really powerful about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, yeah, please. Oh, no. I, 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 so I also wanted to follow up. Uh, so I think, you know, when we're looking at the various modes of disseminating one's comments or one's work, I mean, there are a lot of things that are coming into play that, are, you know, weren't around five years ago. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, this is but one tool in our arsenal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, your question um, th that you asked earlier about engaging your faculty members, you know, I think it is probably safe to say that the majority of facu faculty members do feel pressure to try and um, put their best foot forward, and that's motivated by a number of different things. Right. So it can be internal pressures from the institution, or um, it can be external pressures from the field. Right. And so if you can take advantage of some of these things in order to optimize who you are and right. optimize how you're presenting yourself, I think it makes a big difference. I, you know, I, I mean, we work with faculty members all the time, mm. and you know, this is very valuable. We have a really great reception on, on this kind yeah. of work. So. So, you know, and there are things that you can get started with that aren't necessarily, I know I talked about, um, I, I probably gave the impression that one needs to put on a hard hat and galoshes in order to get this done, you know, but there are places where you can start even in the citation databases that can provide really meaningful information. So if you look at some of our um, some of our indices that are available, you can see, um, you know, who is citing a particular paper, but then you can dive deeper and see, you know, wh uh, what countries are those um, citations coming mm, from? What languages great. have those been published in? I mean, are you disseminating your information worldwide, um, right. or is it just happening, you know, in the United States? Right. Um, you can, I mean, there's a lot of things where you can provide value add that people can incorporate into um, you know, uh, promotion and tenure packets, uh, grant renewals, um, uh, uh, center, um, like annual progress reports for core research facilities or, um, you know, virtual groups and things like that. Right, right. Yeah, great. they love it. I mean, we've got all these great tools in the library, and I think that people just don't actually know that, number one, there are these wonderful people in the library that can help them use them, and that there are these tools at mm -hmm. their disposal. So, yeah. you know, that's my plug for libraries, yeah. or one of many probably. Plugs. I heart libraries, too. Thanks yes. for your different perspectives. Thank you. That was really great. Hi. So, um... To what extent do you guys think it is important or feasible to do something more than just count uh, citations to something, but rather to do something about the content? So 
isn't it different if somebody says, this is the best article I ever read, or this is the best thing I've ever heard, to, hey, could you believe this idiot published or posted something like this? And I'm particularly interested in it because I'm a, a journal editor, and I don't like the fetishization of journal articles, by the way. I'm trying to get my readers to do more offline. And um, I, you know, people cite other articles for the most ridiculous reasons. You know, they could have cited from 100, and they picked their, their advisor's article, for example. And it's a psychology journal, so sometimes they're citing other articles for the methods, for the analysis, it's just broad general background. In the conclusion, they're citing it because they agree with it or because they disagree with it. And these all just go into one big, you know, citation or impact factor count. And I'm always um, sort of comparing to the way the legal system does it. So when a case cites another case, we know what it's cited for. Is it consistent? Is it inconsistent? Has it overruled the other case? Is it just sort of in passing? And I kind of wish we had a way to integrate that into what we have formally in you know, journal citations, but could it even be done more broadly? Thanks. Could I ask a quick question? Um, I would imagine that in the legal context, it's very common for something to be disputed or overruled. But I would imagine that in the scientific context, the vast majority of citations would be positive, not, I mean, I agree every once in a while someone's shooting something down, but it's got to be so rare. Like, would that matter that much? You must have some examples in mind. I was wondering if you could clarify. Well, there's lots of times when you come up with, uh, with data that, is, that are inconsistent with somebody else's research. And, and in fact, I think part of our problem right now is that that gets ignored too much and not aggregated. Um, so I, I think it's really important to keep track of that, even though in some sciences it's smaller than it is in other sciences, in some sciences it's greater, but I think it's important to keep track of what's going on. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting field, it's a really interesting area, and a lot of people have asked the same question. There's been several decades of work on it, so a lot of the earlier work was about just trying to ascertain the context, trying to answer the question of, how many, what, what, what context do people cite in? So Garfield actually, some of his very first work in like the 60s was well, answering just those sorts of questions. And so he had sort of a typology and other people have made typologies. And typically, you know, it's like five to at the most 15% sort of negative citations and the rest are generally positive citations. But as you say, there's all sorts of other things, even where it's cited. If something's cited in the methods section versus in the conclusion, that's really interesting. So there's two sort of approaches to that, right? One of them is the semantic web approach where you sort of say, Let's actually type the citation. Um, let's say this is agrees with, disagrees with, etc. Um, so there's really cool work um, called the citation typing ontology, and another thing called SWAN. Uh, citation typing ontology is often abbreviated CITO, CITO, um, associated with David Shotton. Um, but that stuff is really cool. It's a huge uphill battle, huge uphill battle to get people to actually use that stuff. It's hard enough to get them to just use like a standard format, right? So my personal opinion is. I wish him the best, but I'm not like, I wouldn't say super optimistic about that. The other approach is a text mining approach um, where you sort of do, there's a lot of work in the commercial world on sentiment analysis um, where people will like, you know, you'll read tweets or blog posts about Coca-Cola and say, are people saying good things or bad things about Coca-Cola? So not that much of that has been applied to the scholar world. And the biggest reason is because it's very difficult to do text mining at large scale because of closed access. So as more things become open access, as there are bigger corpora to use these on, and as some of the closed access, publishers start to allow um, l limited text mining of, of their corpora as well, I think we're likely to see, you know, substantial progress on that front. But it's a hard problem. Sudden analysis, I mean, human language is, you know, it's complicated. But it's a great, great question. Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's even, even with um, open, the more, the trend towards more open access, uh, Analyzing sentiment in a scientific paper versus Coke, you know, tweets is, is just a whole other order of magnitude. Um, I think really at this stage, it, we don't have the, the technology. We don't have the, the I, I, I do a lot of um, text mining. My team does a lot of text mining. And we, we, things that you would think are solved, we struggle with, are, are hard. And normalizing institution names, something that trivial, is a hard problem. Um, so 
I think that, that I think we will get there, but I think we're we're fairly far away from having the sophisticated algorithms, the algorithms with sufficient sophistication to tackle um, understanding the nuance and the subtlety of the, the 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 citation. I think at this point it really does come back to people and uh, having a human being interpret, having an expert interpret um, that that work. Um, which and 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 thus again, I, I think that one of the advantages of Altmetric, one of the um, great services it provides to the scientific community, is less so the numbers and more so the connecting of experts. Well, before someone runs out there, I have a question I want to ask for Christy and, and Caitlin, uh, and. Okay, in, in, in um, demography, there's something called the age period cohort problem, which is that um, if you're trying to study behavior, um, if you want to compare people at different ages, they have their different cohorts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. because, because I was born before you were. Um, so, but also I'm older, but then one way to compare people like um, who are different ages would be to compare the young me to the middle-aged me. Um, now we're at the same cohort, but we're we're p comparing different periods. So the young me didn't spend so much time blogging, right? Mm -hmm. So it's Im impossible to do that. Now I'm thinking that in I'm I'm particularly asking Christy and Caitlin because both of you talked a lot about the the human connection. What do people want for out of this? What are people's goals? Which which is actually very interesting from another standpoint, which I can blog about later. Um, but if there's a big, it seems like a very hard thing for us to understand. I, I wonder if we might be confused by the nature of our subjective data um, for, for two reasons. And one is I was just thinking, well, as I get older, I'm less interested in, in publishing in journals. And part of that is journals are less important. Part of it is I just sort of, I've done that already. I want to do something else. And it may be if I were at the same age, 40 years ago, I also would have started to lose interest in publishing journals. Conversely, I wrote a textbook when I was 30 and one of my comments made the charming comment, my colleagues, one of my colleagues made the charming comment that isn't that what people do when they're too old to do research? And mm -hmm. I said I already am, so. No. <laughs> but then the other thing is that we have a um, demographic, I'm not even demographic transition, but there, there's a, equivalent of the baby boom, but more so. There's more and more researchers. Most scientific researchers, a lot more scientific researchers are young than all than middle-aged and more middle-aged than old. So there's been a huge change in science um, and it's continuing to change. So I just wonder whether you have reflected upon that in your in your analysis, the idea that like people are doing stuff they didn't do before. Part of it might be that they have different goals, but maybe it's also that people in general, the field as a whole is getting older and more mature, and even if Google, et cetera, had never existed, maybe we'd be sort of getting tired of trying to publish in journals. And sure. so, um, so these are really good points and something, I mean, these are things we see every day, you know, because we'll be working with um, different people at different points in their career trajectory, and you see um, them emphasizing different things. Um, you know, I I will say that um, we do, uh, you know, we do have um, primarily we have our younger people, our junior faculty and scholars who are interested in um, utilizing some of these different modes of dissemination for putting their best foot forward. Um, certainly, but I mean, this is also happening with our more established faculty members, although not at the same rate. Um, I, I would um, like to throw another variable into the mix, um, which is the changing requirements by funding agencies as well. So in um, the last couple of years, we're now seeing um, in like grant renewals, they're asking for evidence of impact. Um, you know, when we're submitting renewal applications for various grants, we're helping people put together stories and put together um, highlighting how their research has made a difference. And it's, it's the difference that um, goes to um, motivations that a taxpayer might have, or it's the motivation toward um, highlighting improved, um, you know, clinical care or something like that. But, uh, you know, I mean, we're seeing kind of a wide range of people. You know, I've worked with um, younger people on our campus who are um, very 
um, very into the traditional way of the way things have always been done. And, you know, and it's delightful when we get someone who is very established in their career and really doesn't need to be, need to be more impactful. And, um, and they're, they're excited about these new ways of judging their influence in their field. I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to pull it all apart. And, you know, when we're looking at trying to compare different cohorts, um, and understanding, like for instance, we do um, a lot of uh, social network analysis of our um, research teams, and so trying to pull out um, cohorts that we can use for valid comparison, how much happens because our world is changing around us, and how much is because of you know people being part of a particular group. It's very difficult to pull out. I mean, it is, it's very difficult. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that, that it, a lot of it's probably about the drivers, and that, um, faculty members that are pre-tenure have a very uh, specific driver. And so their behavior is going to largely be, um, is gonna conform to the standards uh, that that particular research university has, um, has set forth. Uh, and, um, and those are moving at a glacial pace, those standards, those tenuring and promotion standards of um, a, a threshold for, for uh, for excellence, they're, they're glacial. It's a very conservative um, uh, uh, set of criteria. And so I think that um, you could argue that universities could do more to, um, f uh, uh, to, for, to, to s encourage and support um, faculty members to be more communicative mm -hmm. by, by zeroing in on that one very, very profound and influential driver. Of, of uh, research activity. Um, yeah, on uh, building off of what Caitlin said, you know, I do know that there are universities um, that are now starting to, you know, in their promotion and tenure guideline language, beginning to talk about things like collaborative work. So, um, you know, just a few years ago, collaborative work, you know, was something you might have done on the side if you had time, but you really needed to be able to show first author or last author position on a paper. And now, um, you know, we have these very large research teams coming together around genomic medicine initiatives, um, you know, and a host of other things. Physics, you know, is a very highly collaborative field. Um, so that's something that we're seeing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think that that's good. Um, there's definitely been an influence on team science. You're seeing it coming from many of the larger funding agencies trying to support that kind of collaborative approach and putting in place education and training efforts around uh, those ideas. So I'm optimistic. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, last chance um, to ask. I won't put you through any more right now. Let's uh, thank the speakers. For